Today's research and teaching around the white supremacist backlash against progress made during the construction for the racial equality in the United States, as well as being on the subject of service within the 20th century. They have also found Rockford's department of African and African-American studies, believing in that discipline's validity and its importance for students of color and all students. Sitting also hired a generation of historians who themselves went on to hire most of the current Rockford faculty, and if you're a history major or minor, you know some of our professors. I'm thinking of people like Meredith Roman, who researches and teaches about global black radicalism, and will be joining the um, history major, Daniel Jimenez, history minor, Alex Lamonti, and other students on the University of Police Community Relations Committee. And also John Daly, who researches and teaches about the Civil War, Reconstruction, and the Second Civil War of white supremacist violence, and who is faculty advisor to the movement. While we know we have much more to do to unravel systemic racism, the traditions that sit here between it are certainly continuing. And I think we can read more about Sissinsa in the biography in your program. Um, which ends with a link to an interview that Robert Benz of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative did with his daughters, um, Nancy Sinista and Barbara Harris. And Robert Benz and Barbara are here with us this evening, and I'd like to invite Barbara to come up and say a few words now on behalf of the family. Should I use my, or should I use my teacher voice? <laughs> and it's my privilege to represent the Sinistrat family at this year's lecture. And it's also a privilege to be somewhere where people can pronounce my maiden name. <laughs> the only other place beside Bernas in Pennsylvania and Norway. Well, thank you to Dr. McPherson and to the History Department for organizing and orchestrating this evening's presentation. Thank you in advance to Shane Whedon and Calvin Eaton for being here and for the education we are about to receive on redlining and race in Greater Rochester. Sounds like a blessing for what we are about to receive. And a special thank you to Robert Benz, co-founder of Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, for suggesting that Mr. Wiegand's work perfectly aligns itself with the stated purpose of this lecture series. And thank you to everyone here, to colleagues and friends of my parents, teachers, staff, and administration at the college, and most importantly, students and other guests just for coming out on this cold night. Mm -hmm. When I heard about Mr. Wiegand's work, it struck me that he is doing what the Southern Poverty Law Center calls teaching the hard history. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I was also reminded of a paragraph in my father's book called The White Response to Black Emancipation. Mm -hmm. uh, this, that reminded me of what Mr. Wheaton is doing. And here is a quote from the introduction. And this is so my dad. He was always trying to get people to get out and do things, and preferably things that, that included a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication and rallying out the troops and, and improve society and improve yourself. So, here is what he says in his book. Thousands of white teachers are needed to study the real story of race relations in America and then present it to students at every level of education. Mm -hmm. The effort calls for massive involvement. Those who participate may take satisfaction from the thought that they will be committing themselves to the greatest social need in America today. 
Sadly, it is still the greatest social need in America today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, students um, from Rockport, both those who are already fully engaged in putting time and effort into improving the racial climate on campus, and students for whom perhaps in a moment like this is a very new experience. Um, I'd also like to welcome guests from beyond campus, especially from Rochester. Um, if we have any Rockport lifelong learners in the room, welcome to you, staff and faculty as well. Um, to Provost Katie Haining, um, VP Mike Andriash, President Heidi McPherson, and her husband Alan. Um, and finally, a very special welcome to History Emeriti faculty, Kathy and John Kudlowski, where are you guys? In the back, they're in the back, look at that. <laughs> Professors in the back. Um, and to our valued history alumni, I know we have um, Allison Denton over here, and we just saw Roger Vitas come in, and Austin is here. So um, welcome to all alumni. We're really grateful that um, she and Megan and Calvin Eaton have come to campus together uh, this evening to help us learn about, reflect on, and discuss the history of our in the River Rochester area. I had the pleasure of seeing Shane's presentation last fall at a social studies teacher conference, and it is excellent. You guys are in for an amazing experience. Um, there are full bios in the program. I'll just briefly say that Shane's a fourth grade teacher, and he does some of this education with his fourth graders, those nine and ten year olds. Um, he has a degree in education along with a history concentration, and Calvin is the founder of 540 West Main, a nonprofit doing community education on anti racism and other topics. Um, and they co founded the annual gentrification conference in 2017. And this April, um, April 4th, I believe, yes, um, will be the fourth annual gentrification conference. Um, and it's not promoting gentrification, right? It's competitive. Um, so there's a link to that in your program as well if you'd like to get involved in that. So Shane's going to talk for about 50 minutes, and Colin's going to lead us in a deliberative dialogue. He has a couple of questions prepared for us to think about in small groups. Then we'll be a chance for audience and other members to ask some questions. And at around 9 o'clock, there will be the beginning of a reception with some great food and drink out in the lobby. And thank you in advance to the History Park members who are going to set that up for us during the dialogue. So, without further ado, in the spirit of Six and stuff, Shane, welcome. I think. Can you guys all hear me? You can hear me in the back? That's working? Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for having me. Um, normally I talk to nine and ten year olds, um, and so all of you, this is a whole different experience and a whole lot of fun um, to be able to be here. Um, I want to thank the college for having me and Anne and uh, your family. I just. When I got to read this book, it, it really it was impactful to me, especially that quote that you read, which you'll see again later in the presentation. Um, my talk today is called Racist Policy and Resistance in Rochester. And it's about how structural racism has created um, incredible disparity in Rochester. And if we can take a look at how that structural and racist policy has created the situation that we have in Brockport, in Rochester, in Webster, in Penfield, um, if we can understand the causes, we can be a part of ameliorating them and creating a more just and equitable Rochester for all. So I'm here tonight because about nine years ago, I started teaching fourth grade. And one of my students said to me when we were learning about Martin Luther King, because most kids learn about Martin Luther King, they said, was there racism in Rochester? And was there a civil rights movement here? And I had no idea. I, I said, I've lived here my whole life. I grew up in Webster schools. And I couldn't tell you a name of a civil rights leader in Rochester. And I said, I, I have no idea if there's racism in Rochester. But then as I thought about it, I realized, I guess I'm starting to become aware that like, Rochester's pretty segregated. And then I said to my students, you know, in Webster, I never sat next to a student of color. I never had a black teacher. So I said, yeah, I think there's a real racism problem in Rochester but I don't know why, I don't know who, I don't know who fought against it. So like a good teacher, 
I said, I'll get back to you. And I had no idea that getting back to that student um, would lead me to a place like here tonight. Or four years ago, three years ago, I wrote an angry email to Evan Dawson on WXXI Connections. It's like a lunchtime call-in show. And he said that segregation in Rochester was by accident. So I sent like a quick email. I was like, hey, man, my fourth graders know better. Ha, take that. You know? And then he was like, hey, can you come on the show over your winter break? And I was like, ha, ha, ha. Okay, I have tenure. I will come on the show and talk about this. And I did, and I had no idea what would come of that. Um, in the last few years, I've given a version of this presentation over 100 times. I've trained several hundred teachers in the Webster School District, Rush Henrietta School District, and the Rochester City School District. And I'm working with Pathstone Housing Corporation, a non-for-profit that hopes to build affordable housing in the suburbs, um, to design and build a curriculum um, at multiple grade levels and train teachers in all 18 school districts in Monroe County to be able to teach both the story of racist policy in our community and those heroes that resisted against it. You can see on this page three of my students, Simra, Bailey, and Kaliat, and these are some of the students that have inspired me to continue to do this work and who I've done this curriculum with um, and, and talked about a lot of the things I'm going to share with you today. And later in this presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about their story and how it's intersected with some of this work and resistance to these problems today. To start, though, I want to let you know about some of my sources. Um, the most important source is called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Um, he came to Rochester last summer with Pathstone. I helped bring him here. He's read through this whole presentation. He found two mistakes in the speaker notes. I had a date wrong and I misspelled a Supreme Court Justice's name. I fixed it, so this is Rothstein approved. Get excited. You're welcome. Next, the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle newspaper archives. You're going to see quite a few photographs from in there. Um, the New York State Commission Against Discrimination Report from 1958, which will show us a lot of the effects of these policies. And the Rochester Voices Project with the Rochester Public Library that interviews civil rights heroes in Rochester and shares their story in the fight against housing segregation in Rochester. I want to start with also a couple of quick definitions. So when I reference these words, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm going to use Ibram X. Kendi's definitions. He defines racism as a marriage of racist policy and racist ideas that produces and normalizes racial inequality. A racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. And an anti-racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups, laws, rules, procedures, processes, regulations, any guidelines that are governing people. And before we start, I want us to kind of center ourselves um, for what is going to be a, some difficult history or hard history and a difficult conversation. This book, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, which was originally introduced to me by Calvin, has really helped me understand my own whiteness, my complicity and inaction and participation and benefit of these, from these racist policies. And, and holding this with me as I talk and as you listen is something I think is important, especially if those of you who are white in the room who may feel defensive at times. She writes this. The key to moving forward is what do we do with our discomfort? We can use it as a door out and blame the messenger and disregard the message, or we could use it as a door in by asking, why does this unsettle me, and what would it mean for me if this were true? So in Rochester, we love to tell ourselves a story, and it's the story that, that I grew up with, the story of Frederick Douglass, an, an amazing hero of civil rights, right, who felt more at home here than anywhere else in the country. Of Austin Stewart, a little lesser known, but he was actually enslaved in Sodus in Bath, New York. He escaped to Canandaigua and opened the first black-owned business in downtown Rochester, ran a hub on the Underground Railroad, and started the first school for African Americans in Rochester. The home, of course, of famous suffragists like Susan B. Anthony and Hester Jeffrey. The home of great innovators um, who literally built this city, like George Eastman, but whose legacies, while often celebrated, the more complicated and racist side of their legacies are often left unexplored. We're the homes of many incredible uh, places of learning, like the one that we're at today. And yet we also have a story in our community of incredible disparity that often people choose not to face. The 2017 Act Rochester Hard Facts Report tells a very different story of Rochester, one where African American children in our region are more than four times as likely as whites to live in poverty, one where both African Americans and Latinos are less than half as likely to own their own homes as their white counterparts. A, society, a community that when you look at this population map from 2010 from our census, you can see it's a little, maybe a little hard in the light here, but one blue dot stands for one white person, one green dot stands for one black person. You can see the incredible segregation in our community. 
New York schools statewide are the most segregated schools in the entire country, more than Alabama, more than Mississippi, more than Florida. Just last month, EdBuild found that the nation's most segregating school district border divides Rochester from Penfield, so the number one place for school segregation in the country. We know it's schools like Brockport, which mirrors the majority of schools in our area, that our faculties, we see racist policies there. Here at Brockport, 86% of the faculty is white, only 6% is black. Enrollment at Brockport, similar to other colleges, where 71% or more students are white and 11% are black. You can see huge disparities when it comes to life expectancy. One of the privileges I have as a white person is the literal privilege of life itself. According to Common Ground Health, a child from Pittsburgh's almost all white 14534 zip code, born today will live nine years longer than a child from Rochester's 14608 zip code, a previously redlined neighborhood of Rochester. We know nationwide there's an incredible disparity when it comes to wealth. In 2011, the average or median white, the median white household had a net worth of $111,000 compared to a median net worth for black families of only $7,000 per household. So what do we do? How do we get to this place where we see such incredible dispar disparity when it comes to education, wealth, income, life itself? Well, to do that, we have to look hard at the racist policies like redlining, restrictive covenants, zoning, um, and leaders that have continued to keep these racist structures in place in our communities. James Baldwin um, has this quote that to me is kind of the thesis of the presentation and of what Calvin and I want to get across today. He says, not everything that is faced can be changed but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I want to invite all of you in this room today to join me in facing the realities of racist policy that created the incredible disparity that we see today, so that if we know that, we can be a part of fixing it and building a better Rochester and Brockport community. But I want to note that people of color since Frederick Douglass in the Rochester area have been choosing to face racist policy head on, where white folks have chosen to stick their heads in the stand and ignore these racist policies. I want to introduce you to one of my heroes. This is Howard Coles, editor of the Frederick Douglass Voice newspaper on Clarissa Street in the Third Ward of Rochester, New York. He found in 1938, after doing a comprehensive housing study, that there was incredible inequity and disparity when it comes to housing in Rochester for people of color, finding the majority of people of color did not have access to home loans to be able to buy a house, finding that the majority of people of of color were forced into two neighborhoods of the city, the third ward, that Cornhill, Plymouth Exchange, Clarissa Street area, and the seventh ward, that Hudson, uh, Clinton, um, it, that whole area of Rochester, Clifford, kind of near the public market area. He found that over 30% of the houses in those areas didn't have running water, and yet people in Rochester chose not to listen. A few years later, Dr. Anthony Jordan found direct connection in his study of health disparities, finding high death rates linked to housing. He found in 1942 that in Rochester, the black death rate from all causes was 50% higher than that of whites, and the tuberculosis death rate among people of color in Rochester is two and one half that times of whites. A quick note, you'll notice in a historical document like this one, the word, I did not read what he said. As a white person in 2020, I'll always be substituting in person of color, African American, or black. Just a side note for you. In 1946, almost 10 years later, still the city leaders had done nothing. The Reverend Charles Boddy from Mount Olivet Baptist Church faced these issues head on, speaking in the Democrat and Chronicle, saying, the housing situation has always been an enigma to people of color. In Rochester, only two areas have been gracefully made available for him. And if any attempt is made to move out of the black ghetto, that attempt is met with opposition or he could be describing racist policies. And today, I want to explore these racist policies, how racist policies in the real estate industry, restrictive covenants in, in also part of the real estate industry, redlining created by the National Housing Act of 1934 and the VA and FHA-backed mortgages it financed, urban renewal, displacement and gentrification, and exclusionary suburban zoning policies in suburban towns to this day. 
So let's start though with a quick note about the context. I'm going to be exploring the 1910 to 1970 period that many historians refer to as the Great Migration, when millions of African Americans fled domestic terrorism in the South, fled lack of voting rights, land owning rights, and a whole host of other problems to move to cities like Rochester. In Rochester, we had a majority of people of color move from Sanford, Florida, near Orlando, New York, or Orlando, Florida. And they didn't come here to work at Kodak because George Eastman wouldn't allow them to work in his factories. If you're skin didn't look like his. Instead, people came to towns like Brockport, Webster, um, to pick fruit, Hilton, and then eventually made their way downtown to the 7th and 3rd wards. The first area of racist policy I want to talk about is the National Association of Real Estate Boards. If you're a real estate agent, you have to be pretty much a member of this national association that exists to this day. Frank Drum, who you can see here, he was the president of Rochester's uh, Real Estate Board, and he was in charge of enforcing the code of ethics that every real estate agent must follow. And up until 1956, for over 30 years, the Real Estate Code of Ethics read this. A realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or any individuals whose presence will be clearly detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. Black and white segregation being enforced. Now Howard Coles of the Frederick Douglass Voice, he challenged this. He went out and got his real estate license and he showed people of color homes in the all-white 19th Ward and other white neighborhoods of the city. He was quickly forced out of his job by the National Real Estate Board, Frank Drum and his cronies. Dr. Walter Cooper, a famous scientist, a New York State Regent, he came to Rochester in 1954. And in an interview with the University of Rochester, he describes his situation like this, saying the wife and I answered ads for 69 apartments and we were refused at all of them. A PhD in chemistry working at a high level job at Kodak couldn't find a place to live. No real estate agent would show him one outside of the third and seventh ward. Dr. Alice Young, um, in 1957, she's the first black uh, female principal in the Rochester City School District. Um, she wanted to buy a home with a bigger yard in a neighborhood where houses maybe had, had more investment in them. And she also wanted to challenge um, what was the color line at that time, Jefferson Avenue in, uh, in Rochester, where the 19th Ward sort of begins. But no real estate agent in any real estate firm in Rochester would show her and her husband James a home. No bank, including ESL, Lincoln, all the banks in Rochester, they would not pre-approve her and her husband for a mortgage, even though they were upper middle class. So what she did was what the 57 other people of color at this time who were able to buy a home outside of those two neighborhoods did. She found a wealthy white person, in this case Harper Sibley of the Western Union Telegraph fortune, um, to find her a home, to buy it, to lie that they were related and deed it to her kind of secretly under the table and pay a private mortgage. And that's exactly what they did. And in fact, my apologies, um, they had to move in in the middle of the night to their home. They weren't, first of all, they weren't able to go in the home beforehand. They weren't able to look at it. It was just, if you want it, you have to take it, and then you kind of need to sneak in. And they snuck in in the middle of the night with just a suitcase and a crib um, because they were afraid of the Ku Klux Klan. Because in the 19th Ward, there was quite a Klan presence at this time. In fact, in the 20s and 30s in East Rochester, there would be an annual gathering of upwards of nine to even 15,000 fully hooded, cross-burning Klansmen in East Rochester fields, reported regularly in the Democrat and Chronicle. Sure enough, you can see what she wrote um, in the Democrat and Chronicle a few years later describing her situation. The Ku Klux Klan had threatened to burn their house down if they didn't leave the neighborhood. Alice has become someone that I've gotten to become acquainted with, and then she asked me to tell her story. She asked that I include um, that the white family across the street was named the Bushes, and they were one of the only families that didn't harass them, and in fact helped them get the FBI involved and stay in their home for the next 17 years. The next racist policy I want to talk about um, that's created the disparity that we see today is something called restrictive covenants. Now these were really the rage um, in real estate locally and nationwide from 1910 to 1948. So we all know kind of that public symbol in the south of segregation of the white and black water fountains. Well, just as public but not as in your face is a housing deed. And anyone can go downtown to the county clerk's office and you can look at anyone's deed. And I'm going to show you a bunch of deeds that I found in the microfilm at the county clerk's office. And on those deeds, in order to, it was the rage to have put into your home next to maybe how far from the street or no liquor can be distilled stilled in your backyard was that no person of color could ever buy, own, or occupy, or rent this home. 
And this really didn't officially become outlawed until 1968 with the Fair Housing Act. So the first example um, is the Meadowbrook neighborhood in Brighton. You can see here in the 1920s, they described themselves as a first tier suburb in Brighton um, as a carefully planned development. And Kodak actually built all of these homes. It's ESL, Eastman Savings and Loan, part of Kodak. ESL Bank was created to finance the homes in this subdivision in Brighton. And it was so carefully planned that when Harry Haight, the vice president of Kodak, um, built these homes and set out the deeds to each of the lots, in every single deed he wrote this, no lot or dwelling shall be sold to or occupied by a person of color. You can see Kodak Realty Corporation. And this was on all their homes. Brighton, though, had this problem throughout the town. This is Council Rock Estates, built by uh, General Realty and Grafton Johnson. You can see they even advertised this whole area behind Midtown Athletic Club as having rigid restrictions that have desirable social character of the homes. People were looking for these racial restrictions in order to want to move into one of these neighborhoods. Pittsford, East Avenue Estates, kind of the whole area around St. John Fisher and Oak Hill Country Club. You can see rigid restrictions advertised in the paper. And this is a photograph that I took of the actual deed from the clerk's office for this whole neighborhood downtown. It's still an almost all white neighborhood. In Irondequoit, over 2,000 highly restricted building lots were advertised, and you can see the deed to those lots right here, um, uh, saying legally no person of color can move in or own one of these homes. I know I'm going overkill here, but I want you to get the point that this wasn't something that happened in maybe one or two places, or it wasn't just Kodak who was a bad actor. This was something that throughout our local real estate industry and nationwide that was huge. And in fact, Yale Law School has recently signed the City Roots Community Land Trust as a client, and we're looking into writing a policy proposal so that we can let everyone know in Monroe County who has one of these on their houses and send them a letter letting them know and give them the opportunity to add a disavowal and a statement of welcome onto their deeds. So hopefully I'll be able to give you an update in the future about what's going on there. This is Norman Hawk and Gates, over 250 homes financed by the federal government. They wouldn't finance it without the restrictions. Several hundred homes in Greece in the Dewey Stone Road tract. Um, in the Beechwood neighborhood where I live, right next to School 33, um, this part of the neighborhood, which used to be a professional baseball field where Babe Ruth even played, had restrictive covenants on every one of the lots. Just one street over where I live, the property values dropped by almost half. And the reason was, if you had a racial restriction on your home, a bank was more likely to give you a home improvement loan. Whereas one street over, where a majority of people were Italian at that time, they were less likely to get that loan. Judge Reuben Davis, the first black judge in Rochester, he faced these racial restrictions head on. He says, my wife and I were looking for a house. It was in 1958, and we saw a house we liked on 135 Elmdorf Ave in Rochester, just a block or so west of Genesee Street. I'd say there were probably four black families that lived anywhere west of Genesee Street at that time. One of those families was Dr. Young's family that I showed you earlier. The owner refused to sell to us because we were black, and there was a restrictive covenant in the deed that these houses, when built, were not to be sold to people of color or to Italians. It's important to note that before 1944, when the GI Bill got passed, legally Italians and Jewish people um, were deemed people of color. They weren't deemed white. It wasn't the same as being a black person, but it was somewhere in between, and you couldn't get um, a mortgage financed by the federal government if you were Italian or Jewish until the GI Bill was passed um, when Jewish and Italian veterans now had access. But black veterans did not have access to these mortgages. A quick note about Judge Davis. He found a white lawyer from the NAACP to buy this house for him on Elmdorth Avenue and just like Alice Young did with Harper Sibley, sell it back to him under the table. And this was the common practice if you wanted to own a home and you were a person of color in Rochester at this time period. These are the areas where I found covenants around the city of Rochester, upwards of three to 4,000 so far I've found. The next area of racist policy that's contributed to the incredible disparity we see today is the New Deal, specifically the National Housing Act of 1934. 
So it's the wake of the Great Depression. There's a housing crisis. People are out of work. And uh, from New York State, our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and senator from New York, Senator Wagner, they write this big law that forever changes the face of what America looks like. It essentially builds the suburbs. It sends out over $119 billion in subsidies or government handouts for white families to be able to buy homes and build out the suburbs. It creates the 30-year uh, mortgage, uh, the government-backed loan. It creates that like low interest rate that so many of us have on our homes if you're a homeowner today. Um, but it was only accessible for some. This is taken right from the underwriting manual for the National Housing Act, and it said this. Notice this racist policy. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it's necessary that properties shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. And then they justify it with this racial idea. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. They go even deeper in the underwriting manual, more specific to say that if you're a developer and you want to build a new suburban home track like Norman Huck out at by Brooklyn Country Club and Gates, you have to impose these deed restrictions to get federal financing to buy building materials. And restrictions should include the prohibition of the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they are intended. Now, Ibram X. Kendi, in his book, Stamp from the Beginning, gives us some insight for how to think about these racist policies. So often we think about racist policies as people like white senators from the South. That was kind of who this problem was. We don't think of FDR as a proponent of someone who's like directly responsible for the disparity we see today in housing segregation. But Kendi describes it saying it like this. He says, time and again, Powerful and brilliant men and women have produced racist ideas in order to justify the racist policies of their era. Put another way, the ultimate goal of racism is the profit and comfort of the white race, specifically of rich white men, like both of my grandparents. Both of my grandfathers got 30-year FHA mortgages in the 1950s and 60s that people of color could not have gotten. One of my grandfathers, because he was a veteran, didn't have to put any money down to buy his house. He slowly paid his low rate mortgage for over 30 years for his home in Greece. Both grandparents used the money, the equity they got from their homes to send their kids to college. My grandparents helped send me to college. They helped fix my car when my car crashed, right when I came out of college. And I'm standing here today, I'm debt free except for a mortgage, which is kind of good debt. Um, and I'm speaking to you as a beneficiary of this racist policy and uh, generations of wealth passed down because of these policies. And the way they enforced this segregation in the National Housing Act was through something called redlining. And this is a term that a lot of people have started. It's becoming a little more popular to hear this term, redlining. Now, the National Housing Act tasked the FHA um, with figuring out where it's safe um, to build and insure homes and to define what safety means. And so they go around and on these residential security maps, as they're called, they rate neighborhoods in almost every city in the United States. You can see the green and blue areas are the best and desirable neighborhoods um, because white people live there who are upper class. Yellow areas were for laborers, maybe immigrant families. And red areas were deemed hazardous parts of the city, no mortgages, because people of color already lived in those neighborhoods. This is the assessor's report of Corn Hill. Um, I show this to my students and we compare it to Pittsburgh. I'll show you this real quick. Some of the things my students notice, they notice the incomes of people in this neighborhood. They notice 10% of the neighborhood is foreign families and it's Italian, which if you know before 1944, it wasn't good to be Italian. 75% black in this Corn Hill neighborhood of Rochester, and that's why it was redlined. Whereas in Pittsburgh, this is that East Avenue Estates where you saw restrictive covenants had been put onto all of the homes by Oak Hill Country Club. You can see the incomes are significantly higher in that neighborhood. 0% foreign families and 0% black families lived in that neighborhood. Thus, it was blue-lined or green-lined. In fact, all of Rochester's suburbs and the suburbs in most cities in the north were green-lined. And this policy was so effective that by 1960, the most integrated suburb of Rochester was Henrietta, which had 11 individual people of color residing there. Majority doctors and lawyers and scientists from the NAACP, like Dr. Cooper, who was the first black person to move to Henrietta in 1958. And there was an organized effort to integrate that community because it was more of a farm and it was easier to get out there to do it. The FHA and VA, according to Richard Rothstein, 
they insured half of all new mortgages nationwide during this time period. They gave out over $119 billion in mortgage insurance. This is Alfred Gerdes, and he's driving a bulldozer, smoking a pipe, and he was our underwriter for Rochester and Buffalo, responsible for overseeing this racist policies right here. And in fact, here he's bulldozing ground in Brighton for the Brighton Manor Apartments. This was public housing for veterans. Howard Coles, who you remember from the beginning, the, the Frederick Douglass Voice newspaper, he helped several black veterans who were married with children and met all the requirements apply to live in this public veterans housing. Every single one of them was denied um, by Elmer Milliman, who kind of was overseeing this whole program, and Alfred Gerdes. Um, same at Fernwood Village, Ramona Park, Seth Green, and Cobbs Hill. So public housing in Rochester was originally just for white folks. Rothstein goes on to say that over 35 million families benefited from FHA-backed loans nationwide, and that 98% of these beneficiaries were white. Now, in Rochester, we want to think of ourselves, or in Brockport, is we don't really have a problem with racism. Maybe there's some issues, there's some gaps that we need to work on, but people wouldn't have wanted these policies here. We're the home of Frederick Douglass, when in fact, it was a local tradition in every town in Monroe County and its surrounding rural areas to have blackface minstrel shows at almost every elementary school, high school, Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club, most churches and town halls would put on these racist shows, called a minstrel show, and every minstrel show followed the same pattern. You had three main characters called N-Men. You had Jim Crow, which would be someone in blackface, like one of these kids you can see here. You'd have Jim C-O-O-N, and then you have Jim Dandy. And they would mock the intelligence of people of color, um, they would mock politics at the time, and they would raise funds for their all-white institutions. This is Honeyway Falls in 1960, proudly displaying um, all of their students from the Cub Scouts uh, performing this racist show. These are the same people that voted for these policies, allowed these policies to continue, and would organize when people of color tried to move into their neighborhoods. Brockport had a real problem with this, just like almost every other suburb in our community. The Brockport Fire Department had an annual minstrel show that went on for over 45 years. Uh, the Cape and Hose Company here in Brockport, if, I don't know if any of you have driven by this building before, but you can see here they have their annual minstrel show. And one of the things I found in the newspaper that described it, it's as much a part of Brockport life is the Fireman's Carnival on the 4th of July. So this was a Brockport institution to dress up in blackface and perform this racist show. You can see at the high school in 1950, they'd have their annual shows, their blackface, blackface jokes and skits. You can see here at the college, which was called Brockport Normal then, um, the Varsity Club would present their minstrel shows in full blackface as well. Kodak really kicked these off in the 20s. You can see the executives at Kodak Park dressed up in blackface even their children. You'll notice that's the kids of James Wiegand in blackface. My name's I-E, not E-I. So that's important to note, but it was too close to not include. Um, you can see here in the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle in 1952, the paper saw fit to publish this horrendously racist photograph of Newark Junior High School performing their minstrel show. You can see in Greece, um, Mrs. Betty Davis's class, the kids are proven to the grown-ups that they can perform in blackface too. And these are the towns I've found that have hosted these shows, the city and almost every one of the suburbs. Of course, people of color they didn't stand for this. They spoke out. Beginning in 1955, um, it was Reverend Quentin Primo, um, it was Flora Davis from the NAACP, and even white folks uh, like Harper Sibley, who you remember Alice Young's friend from earlier, they wrote letters that they sent to every single elementary school, college, and town in the area, letting them know that the shows they were performing every spring for their fundraisers were racist and needed to stop. When schools and universities chose not to stop these practices, they published a letter to the editor in the Democrat and Chronicle that I think sums up and really gives us some context for the racist policy in Rochester and what we still see today. They said, blackface minstrel shows must be banned from all public and private schools, churches, and public buildings. To do otherwise will cripple permanently the attitudes of all white youth involved in these community accepted shows towards all of the dark skinned people of the world. Now imagine how many of those kids in 1960 in that Honeyway Falls show dressed in full blackface are still alive today 
who are still running our institutions, teaching our children, administering medicine in our community. And maybe they wouldn't say the N-word. Maybe they would say they're the opposite of racist. Or maybe they'd say they don't have a racist bone in their body. And yet, it's undeniable that a majority of people in our community in Monroe County were so socialized in a white supremacist society, just like I was, going to school in Webster where I never had a black teacher. I never had a black peer sitting next to me. Think of the message that taught me. Segregation is OK. Segregation is acceptable. And that's the message we continue to send to our kids when we look at our staffs, our faculties, and our enrollments, and our students in our schools throughout our elementary schools to high schools to colleges, universities, what have you. So I want to talk about the full effects of how this plays out in our community. And people of color had advocated and advocated. Instead of action, they got a really nice report that helps us understand what happened. And in 1958, the New York State Commission Against Discrimination from Governor Harriman tells us quite a bit about the full effects of redlining in our area. They found that by 1950, 80% of all Monroe County residents who were black lived in the third and seventh wards of the city. Those same two neighborhoods that Howard Coles and Reverend Body were talking about at the very beginning of this presentation in the 30s and 40s. In these two neighborhoods, more than 1,600 units had either no bathrooms or a shared bathroom. Over 2,000 units, there was incredible overcrowding with more than one person living in each room. In these two wards, to me this is the most staggering fact, 30% of all units had no running water in 1958. You remember 20 years earlier, Howard Coles had expressed some similar statistics about these two neighborhoods, and the commission had found that nothing had changed in these neighborhoods. Despite all the charity that you can see the Democrat and Chronicle doing, or the United Way and other institutions, they couldn't see fit to fix a racist policy when it just came to like running water. Connie Mitchell, though, was one of the people who stood up and faced these redlining practices head on. She ran for office and became the first person of color in Monroe County to be elected. She described the situation like this. She wrote, we're living in a community that was bursting at the seams because there wasn't open housing. When John and I bought our house on Greg Street, the real estate agent told us, he said, I can't show you houses west of Jefferson Avenue. They're just not open to black people. So we were confined from Jefferson Ave back to the river to look for a place to live on the west side of the city. It took her two tries, but she defeated the landlord and druggist, Lester Peck, who had several times called her out in the paper, calling her racist things, saying it was people of color's fault that their houses didn't have running water, when Connie Mitchell wrote right back and won, calling out the city, the state, and the nation for not supporting investment in these neighborhoods where people of color were forced to live. The report goes on to say that not a single FHA or VA loan was given to a person of color in any of Rochester's suburbs. Pittsford during this time period goes from having maybe 5,000 pe people living in Pittsford, and all of a sudden you have this massive government surplus that allows builders to build suburban housing tracks, and Pittsford's population jumps from 20 to 30,000 to today way higher, all because of these policies. And people got these federally subsidized homes in all of Rochester's suburbs thanks to this National Housing Act of 1934, and it was only for white folks. In the 1950s, the report found that only 57 black families had found a home outside of the 3rd and 7th Ward neighborhoods of the city. You remember earlier, Henrietta was the most integrated uh, community in Rochester with 11 individual people of color. Two of those individuals were the Wells family, Dr. Cooper, um, the Lee family, and the Biases. And the Biases were one of many people of color that when they moved into a black neighborhood, they faced something um, that scholars call move-in violence, where it's overt and violent racism that's happening, or resistance. The Biases actually, he was a dentist, Thomas. He bought a house in West Arondequoit. The Klan threw bricks through his living room window, threatening them with death, threatening them they better move. So he and his wife, Hermina, decided to sell their home in Irondequoit and join Dr. Cooper and the Wells and the Lees out in Henrietta, where in solidarity they were able to spend uh, the rest of their days. Another story that I want to tell is the story of Peter Tolliver. He was a scientist at Xerox and one of the first people of color to move to Brighton. He actually moved to Verena Street, uh, kind of near the Brighton High School. 
And all of the white neighborhoods, neighbors on his street, when they found out he was buying the home, like he'd signed the deal, but he hadn't paid the check yet, they organized all the money to buy the house in cash outright from the bank under him. He had to sue. He got a couple of the, the temples involved in the town that helped with this big fight. It was all over the Democrat and Chronicle, and he spent the rest of his days living there next to the same people that tried to buy his home out. But I've heard that same story in Penfield, that same story in Gates, in Brockport, in Webster. This was a common thing where neighbors would organize and try to buy a home out from someone or threaten them with leaving. Meanwhile, people who were white were making millions of dollars in the real estate industry, money they couldn't have made without these massive federal subsidies that were going out to builders. For example, Max Farish. He was one of the biggest builders of homes and apartments in Rochester, especially in its suburbs. The DNC reported in 1973 that he'd found over $100 million in the real estate industry just from Rochester alone. Today, the Farish Foundation is one of the biggest foundations in Rochester with over $500 million um, in their fund, a majority of which money has ca came from these racist policies. And now they're doing charity back in those same neighborhoods. That's not reparations, in my opinion, right? And so we need to look at where this money comes from. Same with the ESL Foundation. We have to think about how things get funded in, in our community and how that connects to these racist housing policies and who has the power and who has the say. The next area of racist policy that leads to disparity today is the destruction of urban neighborhoods through something called urban renewal, which happened largely in those red line neighborhoods of the city, the seventh and third wards. And it led to incredible displacement. This is Elmer Milliman, one of the architects of public housing that was segregated in urban renewal, and John Dale, one of the city planners of, of Rochester. Now, Howard Coles, again, from the Frederick Douglass Voice, he tried to get on this public committee um, for urban renewal to help allocate the $30 million in federal funds for highway construction um, and new homes to be built. They wouldn't allow him on because of the color of his skin. And during this period in the 1950s through the 60s, to build the highways like this one right here, 886 families were displaced from their homes in the seventh ward. In the third ward, over 850 families were pushed out of their homes, a majority of which were people of color. You can see on Plymouth and Troop, 490 going right through there. That was a majority black neighborhood in the red-lined third ward, the Cornhill neighborhood. It really destroyed the social fabric of many of these communities, where even though these communities had lacked investment, they were still the really only integrated communities of Rochester. Black, Italian, Irish, Jewish, they lived in these neighborhoods together, sometimes getting along, sometimes not, and kids would even go to school together in those neighborhoods. But with urban renewal and with redlining and the massive government subsidies, white folks were eventually able to leave these neighborhoods where black folks did not have that option. And in fact, they lost the social connections that they had built in their neighborhoods because of urban renewal. For example, one story that really exemplifies this is the story of Pepsi in Rochester and the Church of God in Christ. This is the Church of God in Christ in 1940, the Reverend Caldwell standing in front of it on Ormond Street in the Seventh Ward. Fast forward about 20 years, Pepsi's threatening to move to the suburbs. But Frank Staropoli Sr., who's the president of Pepsi in Rochester, he's best buds with Mayor Frank Lamb, who says, hey, I've got all this federal money I'm going to clear out this black neighborhood and I'll help subsidize your million dollar factory, which today is right where the Church of God in Christ used to be. That church got knocked down, a hub in the neighborhood. People were displaced from their neighborhoods, forced into the third ward to Jefferson Avenue, where incredible overcrowding resulted. All of this leads to the uprising or rebellion of 1964. Over three days, um, people rose up in the streets against police brutality, against housing segregation. And in fact, Carolyn Vaca, the county historian, went through all these arrest records in 1989 and compared them to census tracts. And she found that the uprising was directly caused by people who had been displaced, people who didn't have running water in their apartments, and of course, police brutality. But Rochester wasn't alone. Almost every northern city across the country had a similar uprising or rebellion in its red line neighborhoods, directly linked to housing segregation, to urban renewal, and issues with policing. And so when Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, Lyndon Johnson used that um, as his excuse to push through the 1968 Fair Housing Act. And this act said that the Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, they had the authority, and just them, to affirmatively further fair housing. 
That's really all it says. It outlawed redlining and restrictive covenants, but it didn't really give the government any tools for enforcement, aside from maybe taking funds away from sewers or block grants to build highways and neighborhoods. And when Mitt Romney's dad, George Romney, tried to enforce this in Warren, Michigan, quickly President Nixon ordered him to cease and desist and eventually fired him and ordered that this act not be enforced nationwide. And in 1972, in his uh, memo to his chief of staff, John Earl, Lickman, he wrote this, and I think you could hear this said in most of our communities in Rochester today, a similar sentiment. He says, I'm convinced that while legal segregation is totally wrong, that forced integration of housing or education is just as wrong. I realize this position will lead us to a situation in which black people will continue to live for the most part in black neighborhoods and will be predominantly black schools and predominantly white schools. The final area of racist policy that exists to this day is something called exclusionary suburban zoning. Connor Dwyer Reynolds, who's a, his, a, a law professor at Yale, um, his senior thesis for his PhD was on this topic. He's from Penfield, and he went through all the town board and town zoning board minutes in Penfield. And he found countless examples of doctors and lawyers in Penfield advocating at these meetings for exclusionary and restrictive zoning that would bar the building of affordable housing in Rochester suburbs that would make it so that lot sizes had to be a certain size and homes had to be a certain size so that people of color would be priced out of these neighborhoods. And in fact, this is what happened with these zoning boards. Like you can see this all-white zoning board in Penfield in 1965, making it today so that while a person of color is allowed to live in Penfield or Brockport or Pittsford, it's incredibly difficult because of how much those homes are valued at and homes aren't being built in those neighborhoods or towns that are affordable the way they were for white folks in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s when the government was subsidizing those homes. And that's resulted in the incredible segregation that we see today across the Rochester community. It's resulted in disparities like incredible concentration of poverty that is still in those two main red line neighborhoods of the city. It's why in Rochester, in those two red line neighborhoods, we have the least amount of owner occupants um, in their homes. And in those green line areas and in our suburbs is where we have the highest amount of owner occupied homes. People who own a home are generating wealth and equity and using their homes to fix their cars, send their kids to college, where people of color who live in these neighborhoods have been denied that access. Their grandparents denied that access and parents, and now today trying to figure out how do we get a home in a town like Pittsford whose schools are supposedly better, but we, we can't do that because there's such a disparity and there's such a gap and we don't have that wealth from selling our starter home or, or living in public housing the way that people did back then. Finally, Empire Justice found um, that there's still a huge disparity and that there's redlining going on today when it comes to home purchase denial rates. They found that in Rochester, home purchase denial rates are the highest in neighborhoods with 80% to 100% of residents who are black those previously redlined neighborhoods, are essentially still being redlined. And in fact, in 2015, Five Star Bank got caught by the state with an actual updated map that they were using to redline black neighborhoods in the city of Rochester. They were given a fine, um, but otherwise, you can see the practice continues. And like I mentioned in the beginning, we have an incredible gap in wealth between white and black in our country and community. Yale found in 2017 that for every $100 in wealth the average white family has, the average black family has only $5. And that it will take black families 228 years to earn the same amount of wealth as white families have today. Just passing a law that says redlining is illegal isn't enough to fix it. We have to do things that go against this, and we have to face the causes of this inequity head on today, the way that Howard Coles did in the real estate industry, the way that restrictive covenants were faced head on by Judge Reuben Davis, the way redlining and VA mortgages were faced head on by Connie Mitchell and many others, the way urban renewal and displacement and gentrification were faced by the thousands of people who uprose in the summer of 1964 and maybe some of you in this room will be part of the group that stands up against the racist and exclusionary suburban zoning policies that exist in the majority of our suburbs today. And this leads me to part of why we're here for this lecture and this quote that Barbara read earlier that I just loved so much, where, she wrote, where he wrote that thousands of white teachers are needed to study the real story of race relations in America and then present it to students at every level of education. And I would include, of course, black teachers as well. But a majority of our teachers in our schools 
are white. In fact, in my school district, there are only 11 black teachers in Henrietta, and we have the most black teachers of any suburban school district in Rochester. And so what I propose is that we take some of this history and we make sure that 4th, 5th, 8th, 11th, and 12th graders have a curriculum that is scaffolded around the complexity of these primary sources that you just saw today to investigate the racist policies that created the disparity we see today and to study the people who resisted those policies, where they succeeded and where they failed, so that those students can join in the fight for equity and racial justice in the Rochester community. A quick example of these three girls, Bailey, Kaliat, and Simra, who took, did this whole curriculum with me. They spent a couple of weeks learning this story, learning about Howard Coles and Connie Mitchell, about redlining and restrictive covenants. After this unit, we we're having a restorative circle about activism, and people they know who are activists, and how we, what do we do about racist policies like the ones that permeate our community today. And Kaliat, the girl in the middle, she looked at me and said, Mr. Wiegand, I think our school is racist. And I was like, what do you mean? She was like, well, it's structural racism. I've never had a black teacher. We only have one black teacher in our whole school. That's racism, right? And I said, exactly. I quoted Ibram Kendi. I, I described, yes, that is a disparity. That's racism. So she said, she looked me in the eye in the only self-righteous way a nine-year-old can. She was like, well, we have to go to the principal and talk about it. And I was like, OK. <laughs> And then in a stroke of genius, I was like, what did Howard Coles do? And she was like, well, he researched it and he got some friends involved. I was like, let's do that first. So we got Bailey and Simra, and they came up every day at lunch, and we researched the statistics. We learned more about structural racism. We invited ACT Rochester to come in and share the report with the kids and answer their tough questions. And then you can see my poor principal, Mr. Pollard. This is a picture of it actually happening. The three girls, they researched it, they made graphs, they created a presentation and a script, and they took turns reading their script and presenting to the, uh, to the principal. In fact, beforehand, they wrote in this cute little note that was like, Dear Mr. Pollard, we'd love to talk to you about a problem we see at Sherman Elementary. Could you invite us in for lunch? And like, that's all they said. And he's like, what's this about? And I was like, oh, it's going to be great, man. You're going to love it. And they sit down. And I'm back there, like I'm videotaping, taking some pictures, because it's the best. And I mean, the, he's blown away. Doesn't know what to say. And he's like, well, it's kind of complicated. There's a lot of issues, you know. And don't we hear that a lot in our institutions? It's more complicated than we think, right? It's more tricky. And yet we have to face these racist policies head on. We have to do things where reparation is actually made so sustainable change can happen. Kaliat, the girl in the middle, looks him right in the eye and she says, have you ever, ever interviewed a black teacher and not hired them? You can't say, I mean, he had to answer. He said, yes, I've done that. And she's like, so who do we talk to next to get that changed? <laughs> so the superintendent comes. The girls present to the superintendent, the assistant superintendent of hiring, and eventually the school board. Um, the community foundation takes us on. They, they turn it into a larger story where this girl's story gets told to thousands of people across our community. And in our district now, our school district is reaching out to historically black colleges, and we're ramping up our efforts to try to reach out and have more teachers of color. As a union, we're starting to talk more about what do we do um, to make it so that we can have more equitable hiring practices and what racist policies do we need to change as teachers to make it so this is happening? What do we need to do with mentorships? And we're trying to put into place actual anti-racist policies to make these changes. If I had spoken out, it might not have been heard. But because these girls spoke out and several other kids afterwards, we're starting to have an anti-racist policy shift in our school district. And can you imagine what would happen if in teaching colleges like Brockport and SUNY Geneseo, people who want to be teachers have to learn this basic history. The kids like myself can't leave Webster or Pittsburgh or Rochester schools without learning about Howard Coles, redlining, restrictive covenants, and Connie Mitchell's battle against it, where they can't have the opportunity to be invited into participating in activism that changes these things. Instead of being told to wait, they get told to do. And they're equipped and told how to go about doing these things and come up with ideas that are so much better than the ideas that I could ever cover come up with because they get told the story of the causes and those who fought against it. So some things that we can do to take action when it comes to racist policies like these. The first thing is it's so important, I know that it's been in the news, we have to advocate for real 
anti-racist policies at SUNY Brockport. When it comes to hiring, when it comes to enrollment, the reporting of bias and all those acts of education, school of education, this has to be a part of the curriculum that teachers are learning how to do. And I'm sure people in this room have so many other ideas that we need to talk about today. If you live in a town and you're a voter, ask your school board, ask your children's principal to make sure this history is taught. I would love to come to their district. You can support City Roots Community Land Trust, where I serve on the board. We're located in the Beechwood and Plymouth Exchange neighborhoods, two previously red and yellow line neighborhoods where the federal government disinvested. And we're trying to reinvest in these neighborhoods through community controlled, permanently affordable land. You can advocate for anti-racist zoning policy in your town. Go to a town board meeting, enjoy the boredom, sign up to speak, say something cool, start a conversation in your town. Don't let it so that Adam Bello and Cheryl Dinolfo, who just ran for county executive, can run for county executive and not talk about segregation as a key piece of their platform. Because of racism and structural racism in our community, if they had talked about it, they, they would have lost. Both chose not to address it. We cannot allow that kind of thing to continue to happen in our political discourse. You can support the Citywide Tenant Union and the Rochester Homeless Union. And I know we have some members of the Citywide Tenant Union here today. Where's Allie? Right there, you can talk to her afterwards. I know she'll have a ton of great ideas for you, of course. And right there, and right there, and right there, and right there. Please make sure you talk to them about how you can support the incredible work that they're doing to fight against evictions. We had almost 9,000 evictions in Rochester last year. We have a shortage of over 28,000 units of affordable housing in the Rochester community. And it's predominantly black and brown folks who are suffering the most from this housing inequity. That if we raise our voice, we can be a part of changing. And finally, I think that reparations has to be a part of this. We've created incredible damage and we have to do something to repair it. And so I would encourage you to to believe, to have hope, that if we participate and we take action and our kids and our families join in, we can really do something about these policies. The final way that you can get involved um, is something that Ka uh, Calvin and I co-facilitate. Uh, this is our fourth annual gentrification conference that's for housing justice. Um, this is our fourth one, and we're trying to lift up voices of the tenant union, the community land trust, and other housing advocacy groups. And this year, our theme is gentrification then and now, resisting it, to talk about stories from past and present of people who are fighting against this, connecting the history to today, to concrete action steps to change these things. And that'll be April fourth at the Barbara Berger I-Zone. And now I'd like to invite Calvin Eaton to come up and help us uh, kind of unpack what we just learned and have a conversation about how we make a more just and equitable Rochester and Brockport community. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Can you get the mics on to Calvin? Can you no. switch over? I can switch, yeah. So Shane's going to Oops. Two. Two. There's the first. technology um, there we go okay, okay there we go um thank you thank you for for 
um, first of all, for inviting myself and Shane to be here. Um, before we sort of dive in, we only have about 25 minutes. And I know that this is a lot of information for everyone to process and synthesize and think about. Um, but what I want to do before we get sort of discussion, which, which for me is always the most dynamic part of this, because as Shane sort of summarizes, it's all about action and what do we do next now that we are equipped with this information. Um, I want to center this conversation and sort of make a personal connection. So I have a, a, a very personal connection to the town of Rockport. Um, I was, grew up in the city of Rochester and was a student of RCSD up until fifth grade. And, and when I ended, my fifth grade year ended, I remember as I was getting ready for sixth grade and all of the, the middle school angst that goes with going into middle school, I remember I, I went to Virgil I. Grissom School Number 7 um, from first to fifth grade. And I remember just maybe a month or so before I was intending to return back to the school, my parents sat me down and told me that I was going to be going to a new school. And that new school was Brockport, a Brockport school. And I didn't know much about Brockport. We had never really been to Brockport. Um, and I remember being very upset. I didn't understand why I was leaving my friends, my support system at school number seven and, and, and needing to go all the way out, which for me at that time was this rural, very country, out in the woods place. And I remember begging them to, to, to change their decision. I don't remember having the language to understand why it just didn't feel right. I remember asking questions like, well, school seven has been fine up until now. What, what's changed seemingly overnight for me? And I remember being very, very upset that, that first year. Um, my parents, just through growing up and learning, they, they picked Brockport for some specific reasons. Um, they, they wanted me to start a new school in a whole new setting at the sixth grade year because that was the school and, and time period for, for the district at that time. Most students were transitioning from, you know, from grade school to, to middle school. So I would not be like one of the only new people entering into a new middle school, but I'd be entering with a whole cohort of new middle school people. So in their minds, that was helping to be as least disruptive as possible. So I share all of that because I remember starting the program, going through the orientation that summer, et cetera, and remember, remembering that first year being, it was a shock, a culture shock, not only a culture shock, but also a logistics shock because what, 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 what it meant for me to come to Brockport now from sixth, sixth grade through my senior year was that I remember that first year waking up at like 4, 4.30 in the morning because the bus came at 5.15. I grew up on the west side of the city. And so that was the beginning of a, of a trajectory and journey where I remember my parents working with me to change a lot of my habits. I had to go to bed a lot earlier than I was used to. I, I remember beginning to like lay my clothes out, get ready for the week, um, because I, I had a long haul pre and after school. And what that meant for me through school was that even though I felt very supported in general, being part of the Urban Suburban Program, which was a integration program specifically designed and created many years ago to be able to give black and black students and students of color um, better educational outcomes um, than, the, than what was accessible to us in the Rochester City School District. Um, I remember that looked like not always being able to participate in all of the activities of my school. I remember rarely, if ever, um, I, could I stay after school for any enrichment or extracurriculars because I was an urban suburban student. There was a bus. My parents did not have the means to come out and travel to Brockport regularly. For me to really be a part of the school and, and, and school community. And so I share this story because it's a story that's indicative still to this day for so many students of color with parents making very, or being forced to because of everything that we sh um, had shared with us today, being forced to make very difficult decisions because all parents want 
the best educational and life outcomes for their students. And it's so often times because of racist policy and procedure, both systemic and institution, that marginalized families are required to make even more difficult decisions so that their children, children like me, will have the same access that other students have. And so I, I value my time in Brockport. I don't regret my parents' decision. I understand why they should be made, but I think that being on the flip side of that and being an educator, being a community educator, and having these conversations, really thinking about how this systemic and racist policy, when we have it aggregated, we look at individual people. Um, I'm someone who has been very intimately impacted by segregation because we have communities now that um, are very, very poor. Rochester City School District has one of the highest poverty rates of any district in the nation. We have a very visceral conversation right now about unequal education outcomes that are still proliferating in the city school district parents and my parents to make very difficult decisions. And many communities um, all around the area oftentimes feel like, well, that's not my issue. That's not our issue. None of us who are here in the room today were complicit in these experiences. We were not alive during this time. But it's incumbent upon us now to take this information in this history and say, what do, what do we do next? What do I do next? What does the community of Brockport, Penfield, Pittsford do next? Now that we know that this history has very real and tangible present day outcomes that we're all living through. And part of the work that I do in the, the world that I see is that if people don't have the education, because we know that a systemic system, white supremacy culture, wants to erase this history and tell us that the inequities and the experiences that people like me have experienced over many decades are because of individual choices. It says that if you just work harder, if you just pull yourself by your bootstraps, if you just do better, you won't be impacted by this system. And even though I'm someone who has many intersecting identities and privileges, I understand that there is a larger system that it will take not just people like myself, but really other white people, other white institutions, other systems to really look at issues like we've discussed tonight and say, why do we have the same outcomes in 2020 that we had in 1940? 50s and 60s. What are we going to do as an institution to make radical change, to not continue to say that's just how it is, or that's the card that we've been dealt? Because we cannot let this continue for another 50 years so that I have children later on, 30 years from now, who are standing in the same place, having the same conversation. What are we going to do with this history, which is a living history that has very real impacts of how people of color and other marginalized identities, and even other white people, have experienced and do experience the world. So, as all of that said, I want to have all of us take maybe five to seven minutes to turn and talk with the person behind you, or a person in front of you, person next to you, to, to think about these questions. How have racist policies like redlining shaped and impacted your life personally? So whether you're a person of color or not, there is an impact that this policy has had on your life. And also think about what can you do and what can the college be doing to dismantle the effects of racist policies like redlining that has created communities that are segregated, that has created communities, have created school districts that are not equal, right? So it's not about a white, a predominantly white district being better. It's about a system that has been set up so that that district has more resources. In a district like RCSD, is not given the same economic or financial funding to be able to have the same outcomes. And so 
how do we reconcile that? What do we do to make change? Because really, the whole purpose of this is not for us to leave here and say that's awful, that, that's so, I'm glad I know that now. It's about to say, what am I going to do tomorrow to be able to change the outcomes? Because we know that many of these conversations, many of these outcomes are present day in, in, our, in our communities right now. So we'll take about seven minutes to do that and then allow folks to be able to um, share with all of us some of the ideas that we discuss in our limited amount of time. So we'll set the timer and then we'll regroup in seven minutes. Shane, I love the presentation. It's wonderful. It's gotten better, right? Yeah, it's, <laughs> you, you got it. Tighten it up a little. Tightened up, yeah, it's great. <laughs> we got some there, some updated, yeah. It's, it's, it's very powerful, for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great job enjoying the conversation. I'm sorry to leave you with yeah, more it's, time. It's fine, yeah, we, we just sort of modify and do the best we can with it's, it's, it's really, you could have a whole hour discussion, right? We don't miss a whole hour. Just, and it's a great turnout, too. Yeah. Students have stayed. Some left, but I think a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so interesting. I don't know. I'm curious what people will say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping this will be one. Mm -hmm. This is more direct confrontation mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. Some of the folks in the back right look like they're ready to say something. Yes. Make sure you call on them. Um, so I was thinking for the conference, and you had you suggested sort of just not having a keynote and, and me sort of introducing and yeah. Ron, Ron Garrow is confirmed. Yeah. Um, I can't even introduce it. I can just see you Yeah. This, the story of what you've been doing with this work and what, what you see as the biggest barriers and structural solutions, you know? Right. Something like that and how do we have this conversation right. the right way. Yeah. Which I see is so much of what you're big into doing. Right. right? Um, I'd love to have, so maybe I'm, I'm sort of envisioning um, some of those, was it, was it Rochester Vision, the archive people? Our voices. Voices, yeah. Are they actually like interviews like, that they've done or it's, it's sound, it's, audio? They're like three hours each and okay. like, there's nuggets. It's Cause I wonder if we could sort of like um, envisioning some type of like a visual that has maybe some, some music and some of that audio as like a... Go for it. We started with some of that stuff. All the links are on there to on each them. of them. So okay. if you wanted to go for it, you should do that. Maybe pick out some key... Like Here. almost like the voice with the finding a photo Our of the person. Would be really cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Connie Mitchell, yeah. Dr. Cooper, talking about sort of that resistance that has been done over the years. Oh yeah. Okay. That could be really cool. Yeah. And I think maybe be able to find some sound bites yeah. from some of the local protests and movements that have happened, especially with the um, Union. Do it. Go. Then I can do it. I'm gonna. I'm going to get some support, yeah. That would be really cool. I mean, I can share all the, there are all the links yeah, in the yeah. presentation. To, you just have to, I, it's like editing, I, wrote, it's a lot of editing. I wrote some of the times down when I found stuff, but I okay. have to make sure I look like okay. two hours, three minutes in. Right. I spent like, a, uh, there was one month where I just like would listen to these watching yeah. the exercise. Right. And then anytime you get to something interesting, I'd like write right. my phone. Right, right, There's a lot of really good stuff. With it. So who... Is, this just an, is, the, is the archive just an aggregate of the interview that they had done over the project? Yeah, was okay. Done that year, whoever the librarian was, it was her thing. Okay. And so, yeah. you know, it's a really cool, it was yeah. all in records yeah. until like five or six years ago, okay. it was all online. Yeah. And there's okay. indexes, too, that you have to go down to get from Phyllis Sweetly. 
I don't. Th I th I think there's enough that I can point you. Sure. Some yeah. are like it's someone talking about the beauty shop. For right. Yeah. Three hours. Yeah, right. Which it's fascinating for somebody, but not. You might. Yeah. Not yeah. for this. But usually in that there may be like a few glimpses of like that's what we need. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Some of those quotes that you saw there, right. they're right from those. Right, so, right, okay. Judge Davis is special. That's a okay. quote. Right. I transcribed a bunch. i got to find where I did that, though. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's exciting. Hey, Alain, we need zero to 38, Alain, just to clarify. Oh, I know. If we, if you, I'm just, like, like, we have Didn't to I talk say about that. Yeah. Or I should say zero to 30. Zero to 30. So you're not right. There, even 30, I, I know a lot of people sleeping in St. Louis right now. Oh, yeah. no, you're right. You're, you should say that. You're totally right. The land trust is just 30 and 50. That's why I put it. Man, I hate that. It should why? just be 30. Why? Or zero. Cut out. I'm gonna do like two minutes. Freestanding mic. Yes. I don't know. Did Ann take it? Did this? Did it? Did this fall on the floor? Hmm. Ann's here. Let me go at this computer person. Hi. There was a, was there a freestanding mic that that it went away. I thought. I don't know what I'm doing with it. If I want to go on to the audience, if I can, did I take it? It was here. It was like, unless Ann, unless Ann has it. Oh, someone's going to do it. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So I wish we had more time for this dynamic discussion. This is this is always 
um, really the, the, the really the most impactful part of these types of events for myself. Um, I, I do want to share um, just before we start to open up some of the dialogue in our in our time left in terms of, of sharing out some of the things that you discussed. Um, I want us to think about again the the, the real life impacts that. That, that redlining, that segregation has had on all of our lives, thinking about um, the life expectancy of, of African American people and of racism. Um, I'm even, t t even just tonight, thinking about all of those hours aggregated over time, added up, that I had to wake up extra early and get home later. All of that has a, a direct impact on the psyche, on the psychological, the physical, the impacts of, of people of color, black women, um, black queer people, on um, the microaggressions, all of these things. But the policy um, that, that's married with the, the racist ideas that come from individual people do take a real life toll. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget that because we might not be seeing those, those very visceral reactions, the, the cortisol level that, that elevates over time. We know scientific studies data support that it does impact the, the lived experience of all of us and those of us who are most most marginalized even more so. So I want we do have someone I think who can pass the microphone around. So um, any just sort of we'll, we'll sort of just have folks, um, maybe three or four people, sort of a, a response to either one of these questions or anything that you might have discussed with the folks that were in close proximity to you. Who wants to start? Don't be shy. Yes. Yes, Joe. I, I remember uh, in recent years there was uh, an organization that was looking at the mutualization of schools. Where yeah. They were looking at um, uh, my, my family. I was privileged. I was raised my kids in Western Ironwood, which was one of the schools that had urban suburban. Yeah. Um, where are we as far as the, is it the political will to have an ongoing discussion yeah. about breaking down those those borders? I know it's around so it's the Great Schools for All. Degree. Yeah, it's Great Schools for All right. is the group. And there, what is the name? Kara Finnegan at U of R. Yeah, Kara Finnegan. There has not been a lot of political will. And that's where all of us individually come in. If, if those of us in the room here are wanting to see a, a, a support from suburban districts to create a more centralized school district that um, would not be forced, but what people would have the choice. Um, there's, a, there's a huge conversation about re equity of resources. So it's not so much about, there, there's a, a debate about whether integration or segregation, and, and that's been going on for decades, but it's really about um, trying to aggregate the resources because for so long, um, the conversation about the financial duress of the city school district and the lack of, of, of equitable funding to match all of the needs of the students and families that the district serves, um, it, it, it's, it's, it can't just be from the Rochester community alone. It will take the support of all of the surrounding districts as well. And, and thus far, there has not been a collective mass of suburban districts and communities that support that. So those are conversations that we can be having with our individual city councils or, or our boards in, our, in these towns, in our districts, I think a conversation with our colleges as well. We, we've seen the, the huge, the, the benefits and the, the supports that have come from the East High School EPO partnership with the University of Rochester. I would love to see something similar from SUNY Brockport and not just one or two city schools, but maybe multiple schools in the district. We see how much the outcomes increase when the, when the school has the resources financially, the teachers, the social workers, the counselors that those students, the holistic approach that East is taking, we see, we see that there's benefit to that. But it, it took thinking outside the box and it took a partnership with, with other public and private institutions. I think there's enough of that around. It's just a matter of, of of people, boards, et cetera, moving the needle on, on those conversations. So, so thank you for that. Any, anyone else? In the back here, yes. Right in the, all the way in the back. That's, 
So I was told to raise my hand on the pairs right there and right there. That was one of the anyways. Yeah. So I think we can do to bring bright lighting to more light. We can have a conversation because even though it's uncomfortable to talk about, because people, we have our different beliefs and whatever, just starting the conversation is the best way we can make bright lighting change or get to change. It's not going to change over life, overnight, obviously, but you start to have a conversation with like people, make them aware of what it is. So like, for example, my friend doesn't have a night class tonight. He's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, at this seminar type thing for redlining. He's like, what's redlining? Mm -hmm. And explain to him like, the scrap notes version of what this is <coughs> so he can understand what it means. Mm -hmm. Just that alone, explaining what it is to people, having these uncomfortable conversations, we can all understand and learn together is how we can start to change things. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and those of us who have, who are, you know, in your, in your places of, of worship, in your places of business, in your jobs, to promote the support, the dollars being given to support programs like this, so that it's not just an annual conversation, but if we have collective masses of individual groups having similar conversations, just giving this education that all of us here, so many adults, have not been given the education. And that's a large, a huge part of the problem, to your point. It's history that we've just sort of glossed over. And that's how we keep replicating the same outcomes, because there's no disruption in that whitewashing or erasure that, that many people of color have understood and have tried to speak out against, but are brushed off. And so look at a conversation like tonight as just a starting point for that. Um, we have time for maybe one more question or comment. Yes. Oh. I'll use my keep your voice. No, we'll use the microphone. <laughs> yes, thank you. Hi. Uh, the one thing that's seemed very far all the time today is this, this is a very complex problem and a very multifactorial issue. Mm -hmm. And while everything has been said is, is certainly a, utterly important and necessary, and so is increasing dialogue. We also have to deal with the fact that there is this vast gap in resources and wealth. Mm -hmm. And we have a country with a punitive welfare system mm -hmm. and an inadequate welfare system and a terrible, inequitable system of health care. Everybody who's been poor, everybody who knows somebody who's poor, knows that if you're, to be poor is to be one crisis away from total destitution. Mm -hmm. And to be poor is to live with crisis after crisis. And there is nothing that supports people through those in our, in our economy, in our, in our government. Mm -hmm. And without that, even without racism, even if we start now in a, in a much better world, people who have $5 for every $100 that, that white people have, mm -hmm are going to have a hard time catching up. It's going to be impossible. So there's that as well. Yeah. So this is where our, our voting power comes in, right? Um, was there someone else? That, did I see a hand really quick? Over here? Can we get one more? Yes, please, Anne, yes. Thank you. Uh, Hi. Well, my name is Ashton. Hi, Ashton. Um, my name is Ashton. Um, because of the type of education that I've had. Like, I know that, like, I, I'm from New York City, so if I go to, like, a guy's or that's all, like, I have to go, I go to solo, which is, like, an hour and a half to, like, I have to go early. Mm -hmm. And then, people who have it on the east side, they have, like, money and all that stuff, they can afford, so they don't want to let them be out of dollars. But people blame people, like, oh my god, like, you live in the Bronx, it's the only day that I live because it's the only place that is affordable because mm -hmm. people don't realize that like it's a cycle. If you're having in the morning, people are like, oh, like, get a regular job. But a regular job is not going to be making enough money. So they see people like, oh, like on the street, like selling drugs. But that's like what they, like what they have to end up doing mm -hmm. to be able to provide their family. Mm -hmm. And then like, you can cycle them again and again. And then how am I going to get out of this? the community that I live don't give me the resources that I need. Yes, so, so true, and thank you for sharing that. Um, we see so much of this in New York City, 
right? So it looks very different in Rochester. Not so different, but it is a difference in how it looks. Huge conversations in New York City and, and have been for many decades. I think that as, in closing, when you think about action, holding your institutional leaders accountable, holding your, your elected officials and, and accountable, and enforcing them to be able to have these very direct conversations. How are you, city council member or town board member, going to address these systemic conversations in our town, in our city, in our community, on our campus, right? And people who are not wanting to push themselves to move the needle, then elect people in office who are, right? So that's a place that we have power. It's all, it also means leaving sometimes our comfort zone and making sure that we're putting ourselves in proximity with people who come from a different socioeconomic status than we do, who look different than we do, not thinking that's their problem, that's not my problem. If you have the privilege for it, for it to not be your problem, then go support and learn how you can support the people who, whose it is, and that's how we begin to not only begin to shift our individual perspective, but really change the institutions and systems that are complicit, who are not often held accountable because the, the, the power system wants to maintain the status quo. And I think if the, the biggest parting words that I have for everyone tonight is to begin to, to push that so that we do have different policies in place that are not supported. And we've seen movements like this happen. We just have a lot more work to do as a collective community. So and our final comment, yes. Yes, um, I grew up in the air that you're talking about. Yes. Um, just um, put the mic up. To come to the house and eat with us. Marguerite notes, Dr. Jordan lived down the street with mm -hmm. doctor. Dr. loves him. But I think we need to awaken the parents. We need to start going into the grammar schools and having this discussion with our children. So what it is is educating. We need to educate our, our parents. It's not about the corners and standing on the corners. That we know who dropped the drugs in the city and who took the jobs away. Mm -hmm and who breaks up when people are living together and in a community and getting along. So I remember when HUD come through, um, I remember when Cornell came through, mm -hmm. um, I remember moving, I was part of the riots. So, like I said, a lot of big people that you've shown on the screen has really come to our house and ate with us, mm -hmm. talked with us, and these conversations. When I was a child, I was going to FHA. I didn't know nothing about it then. So my mother had taught us, go take care of business and come back. Don't take nobody with you or anything. Mm -hmm. So we used to go make the payments and stuff. Once we had moved, I remember when they bought the houses, I walked the rest of the street. Mm -hmm. So the main key is educating. And people do not like to hear the truth. When you go to a yes. county legislature, right. a city council, yes. they want to shut you up for this. But it's got to be told and it's got to come out. And I'm a fighter like that. I'd rather say fight the spirit of people. Yes. Fight the powers. So we united can do this. It's not no one person show. Right. If everybody knows what we got to do, let's get on board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elder. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much, Dan. Yes. Um, so thank you so much all for being here. It was wonderful to see you all talking to each other. Um, I know that many of you might want to talk to Shane or Calvin. What I would encourage you to do is go out to a session and get food. If you don't come down there and keep them here because they need to get out there and get a bite to eat as well. It's good food out there. Cookies and um, fruit and stuff like that. Yeah, any question? Can I have one more? One more. So what I'm going to do just so that we can get to the reception is, um, and it's just you can get personally to talk to these guys, but let's, let's have the conversation out there. And what I really want to encourage you to do is introduce yourself to somebody you don't know, and a third question to ask them is, where did you all up? Thank you all, and if you want to sign up for the workshop tomorrow, come see me. Thank you, Anne.